nihil is a Latin word which means nothing. And from the word nihil comes the notion of nihilism, a philosophical pose which rejects all moral, metaphysical, and religious principles and which asserts that life has no intrinsic meaning or purpose. <coughs> the village atheist, of course, has always been a feature of life, but modern nihilism raises the cynicism of the local scoffer to a principle for organizing an entire civilization. Nihilism has been gathering and growing like a dark storm cloud for centuries and was shaped in the beginning by progressive professors, bohemian artists, and lifestyle libertines who embraced radical skepticism and relativism and then rejected all claims for the existence of God, the reality of an eternal moral law, and the possibility of knowing anything certain about the nature and purpose of human life, especially as those claims are advanced by Christianity. But then, bit by bit, the nihilism of the elite spread out far and wide to become the default way of understanding life for almost everyone who does not hold and emphatically defend and assert another worldview, namely, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But nihilism is not simply about rejecting the sexual mores of biblical religion, although that usually lies at the heart of things. No, the nihilist view of life rests on a foundation of aberrant philosophies like nominalism and voluntarism, which separate the human mind from all connections to reality outside of our heads, and then imprison the human person in his own disordered self-love and fallen tendency toward lawlessness. And from that starting point, it is a short trip to the Gnostic fantasy that we can create and define reality for ourselves however we want to, a ludicrous lie that nevertheless now dominates our culture, as we can see, for example, in the necessity of arguing over, when, over whether men and women can change their biological sex, like changing clothes. I begin with this little review of intellectual history because nihilism is now everywhere in the West, and it constitutes the cultural air we all breathe. From universities and the prestige press to Disney's entertainment empire and our public schools, nihilism and its rejection of all givenness in human life reign supreme and shape the world both around us and within us, whether we want them to or not. For much of the past half century, this worldview of emptiness and nothingness was expressed as debonair nihilism. Beautiful people who were blessed with good health, peace, and prosperity indulged their every desire for pleasure and self-gratification. And then the cult of celebrity and conspicuous consumption rose to the pinnacle of our once magnificent civilization, which was thereby debased. But because nothingness always leads to death, nihilism never remains debonair for long. And so debonair nihilism inexorably descended into murderous nihilism, and the horror of that malignant nothingness now crowds into our lives incessantly. The recent mass murders in a New York grocery store, a California church, and a Texas elementary school are all manifestations of the same nothingness in which hatred and rage destroy life with reckless abandon. The streets of Chicago and other major cities descend many nights into an urban jungle of brutal warfare, and the lives of young people in small towns and big cities alike are destroyed by gang violence fueled by the lust for money and power which come from selling mind-altering drugs that are used by millions of people to flee from the hellscape of a life without meaning into ever deeper nothingness. One universal consequence of nihilism is the unraveling of family life, 
through, among other things, promiscuity and the general abandonment of personal responsibility, especially of fathers for their children. And following closely in that train come mental illnesses and pathologies of many kinds, including the kind that leads to mass murder. As the life of our nation unspools into violence and incoherence in which people are judged primarily by what group they belong to according to race, religion, political conviction, or sexual preference, our pundits and politicians constantly call for new laws, and they look for villains to blame and magic potions to proffer as the way to cure what ails us. But neither locks nor laws can protect us from nothingness, which like a poisonous fume seeps into our towns and into our schools, into our homes and into our hearts, and leads us step by step into despair and death. Consider, in 2020, the most recent year for which we have firm data, 45,222 people were killed by guns in the United States, and 54% of those deaths were suicides. In that same year, about 92,000 Americans died from an overdose of drugs, and at least one quarter of those were also suicides. On the hellish day last week when 19 children and two teachers were gunned down in a Texas schoolroom, nearly 1,000 other children were exterminated in the United States in places called clinics. And over the last five decades, we have murdered 65 million children in the womb. 65 million American children killed in what should have been for them the safest place on earth, their mother's wombs. Our culture, lost in nothingness, insists that fertility is a disease and that children are a burden, no different in the womb than a tumor that can be cut out to restore good health. That way of understanding existence is one face of murderous nihilism, a view of life which also fuels many, uh, misery of many other kinds, like human trafficking, slavery to drugs and alcohol, prostitution, exploitation of the poor and vulnerable, contempt for human life, and the existential despair that leads so many lost souls step by dark step into isolation, self-absorption, rage, wretchedness, and the grave. Friends, nihilism which is spread so far and rooted so deeply cannot be banished by building more prisons or by having better gun control laws or by a war against drugs or by better border security, or by exhortations to tolerance of human differences, or by political crusades of any kind. No, such nihilism, whether it be of the debonair or murderous variety, can finally be defeated and destroyed by only one thing, the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who designed and made this entire universe ex nihilo, from nothing. He is the Lord our God, who through his servant and lawgiver Moses calls out to the entire human race, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your children may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. That divine exhortation to choose life for ourselves and our children by hearing and heeding the Word of God was given final and full expression in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father's eternal Word made flesh, and who by perfectly fulfilling the law and by offering himself as a sacrifice for the expiation of our sins has redeemed us from sin and death, from nothingness, from nihilism, 
and has shown us the path to unbounded glory by following him who is the way, the truth, and the life. St. Luke tells us in today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles that the Lord Jesus continued for 40 days after his resurrection to teach the apostles and to prepare them for their mission to the nations, a mission that continues with us and will continue until the last day when the risen Christ returns in glory. At the end of those 40 days, the apostles were naturally reluctant to let the Lord go, and they still struggled to understand what life in the church would be like after Christ's ascension to his Father. Then the Lord Jesus gave the apostles this final assurance, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And this is the only power Christians will ever receive as disciples of the Savior, to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended, the one from whom alone the world has the offer of eternal life. And the Greek word for witness is martyr. A perennial temptation for Christians is to seek to establish justice as an outpost of God's kingdom by wielding power that the world understands. The power to send armies in defense of freedom, the power to defend the vulnerable with force, the power to punish with might those who harm others. Of course, every nation needs the power to defend itself, to protect the innocent, and to punish the guilty. But that power was not the power wielded by Christ the King in this life, and according to the Lord Jesus, it is not for Christians to build his kingdom with such means, or even to know the times and seasons that the Father has established by his own authority for the coming of the kingdom. No, we are called by the Lord in holy baptism, and sent simply to be his witnesses, to be martyrs, so that the world will know the salvation of the living God and be called out of darkness, the darkness of nothingness, into the light of the gospel. So in the face of such a vast empire of nothingness which bestrides the world, what shall we do? What can we do? We must be martyrs. We must allow everything that we are and have and think and say and do to bear witness that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let us show those who are trapped in the dark despair of nihilism that there is a more excellent way, the way of divine mercy, which sets us free from sin and death and reveals in us even now the abundant life of the new creation by grace through faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. Friends, if the Lord Jesus is at the center of our lives, then there can be no room for hatred and contempt of others. Jesus Christ alone is the end of our personal annihilation of our descent into nothingness. And Christ alone is also the beginning of the everlasting life for which he designed and made us, made us from nothing. Therefore, the Lord Jesus says to us, go and teach all nations. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the world. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.